Well, this morning we come to the ninth in our series of verses worth remembering. And the one thing that uh, I think will become abundantly clear today as I focus on our verse worth remembering is that when it comes to us being saved from our sins uh, and having eternal life with God, that we can take credit for none of it. We can take credit for none of it. And indeed, it's God who should be praised for all of it. Uh, as we've already heard on numerous occasions, our verse worth remembering is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13b. I won't get you to stand up on one leg and read it out with me. Uh, but uh, let's read it out again together. God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. What I'm going to do, friends, is I'm just going to work through this verse bit by bit help you to understand what it says, help you to understand why we contribute nothing to being saved. But I'm not going to go from the start and work my way to the end. I'm going to go from the end and work my way back to the start of the verse. Okay? And so what I'm going to focus on, first of all, is this idea of belief in the truth and what it means. And so, friends, uh, belief in the truth means accepting the truth about who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he will do, which results in us living for Jesus no matter the cost. Now, we've been looking at this idea of what belief in Jesus means over the last few weeks, so let me recap what we've been learning. So true belief in Jesus involves accepting Jesus for who he really is, fully God and fully man. Uh, we heard that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God from John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, Jesus is fully God, just as the Father is God and the Spirit is God. Uh, and we've been hearing over the last few weeks that given what the Bible claims about Jesus, then it's hard to say that Muslims and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Hindus actually believe in Jesus because their ideas about who Jesus is are actually diminished compared to what John 1.1 1, 1 says. Indeed, really what the rest of the New Testament is testifying. So, so they actually dishonour Jesus uh, by what it is that they believe about him. If you're going to believe in Jesus, you actually need to accept him for who he really is. That he actually is fully God. But he became fully man too. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.21? You know, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, that brings us to the second thing we need to accept about Jesus and that is accepting that we can only be declared right with God through Jesus' death in our place. Uh, if you think that you are good enough for God, you do not believe in Jesus. The person who believes in Jesus recognises that they have sinned, recognises that they do deserve punishment from God, but that Jesus came to take the punishment we deserve so we might be spared it. And then thirdly, True belief in Jesus involves accepting that only Jesus can raise us from the dead and enable us to live forever. We heard last week Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die and the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Uh, and so we believe that Jesus will uh, you know, raise us from the dead and transform us into bodies which are fit for life in the presence of God, and he will sustain our lives for all of eternity. Now, as I mentioned last week, we can look at these three things and think it's a very much a head type of thing, belief. Uh, it's all about the things that I accept as true. But one of the things that I showed us last week as we looked at Mark 8, 34 to 35, is that true belief in Jesus results in action. So we read, Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Uh, last week I highlighted this idea that as Jesus followers we must deny ourselves. Just as Jesus the night before he died prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. So we are to deny our will and seek to do Jesus' will. Uh, if we believe that Jesus is God, well, we actually believe that he has the right to command us how to live. 
And uh, we know because of God's character that God actually wants us to live in ways that are for our flourishing. If we truly believe that Jesus died for our sins, then we acknowledge that it is wrong to disobey God, to disobey Jesus. And so if we truly believe those things, we will deny self and put the things of Jesus first. And we'll be willing to do so no matter the cost. That's the idea of taking up the cross. Jesus uh, took up the cross in fulfilment of his Father's will for our sake. Well, just as Jesus was willing to take up the cross in fulfilment of his Father's will, so we must be willing to do the will of Jesus no matter the cost. And if we are willing to live for Jesus, even if that means death, well, that shows that we really believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Or as Jesus says, whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will, save it. So belief in the truth is all about accepting who Jesus is. It's all about accepting what he has done for us through his life and death and resurrection. But it's also accepting what he will do for us in the future, namely resurrecting us. And we show that we really do believe those things by our willingness to live for Jesus now, no matter the cost. So that's the idea of belief in the truth. But what I want to suggest to you is that 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13b tells us that something needs to happen in order for us to be able to believe in the truth. And this brings us to our next point, which is that genuine belief in Jesus is only possible because of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And so we read, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Now that word uh, sanctifying or sanctify is a funny sort of word. We don't really use it much uh, by the way in which we speak nowadays, but it simply means to set apart something for special use. To set apart something for special use. So in my wardrobe at home, there is a suit. Uh, And that suit, if you like, is sanctified. It is set apart for special use. I don't uh, wear that suit when I'm cleaning up at home. I don't wear that suit when I go out for a jog. Indeed, you will never see me wearing a suit here on a Sunday. It's only at things like weddings and funerals or really important meetings that I might wear that suit. So it's set apart for that sort of special use, okay? Well, friends, this idea of the sanctifying work of the Spirit is that the Spirit works to set apart people for a special purpose. He sets apart people for a special purpose. That is to be Jesus' followers. Indeed, uh, the Lord Jesus himself spoke about this sanctifying work of the Spirit in our first reading for this morning from John chapter 3. Uh, You might remember in John 3, Jesus is uh, speaking with a a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus actually says to Jesus, you know, I think, you know, Looks like you're from God, given all these great signs that you do. Well, listen to what Jesus says in response to Nicodemus. He says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Uh, This kingdom of God idea is really what many of us think of when we think of the word heaven. Uh, It's being with God in the resurrected body, enjoying life under God's rule and all the blessings that come with that for all of eternity. And notice that Jesus says that if you want to experience that reality, you need to be born again. Now, when Nicodemus hears Jesus say that, he's perplexed. What do you mean? How do I get back into my mother's womb to be able to kind of come back out again? But the problem is that Nicodemus has totally misunderstood what it is that Jesus is saying. And there's actually a little bit of a word play going on here in the Greek. Uh, the Greek word which is translated as again is the word anothen. And you can translate it as again or you can translate it as from above, from above. And uh, what I want to suggest to you is that when Jesus says you must be born anothen, he actually means you must be born from above. Whereas Nicodemus, when he hears that anothen word, thinks that Jesus is saying he's somehow got to hop into his mother's womb and come out again. 
There's a misunderstanding. When Jesus says you must be born from above, he's talking about you need the Spirit to give you rebirth. Uh, indeed, this comes quite clear in verses 7 to 8, where we read, You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again or born from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So born from above means born of the Spirit. And it's the same idea as being sanctified by the Spirit in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. So being born from above, born of the Spirit, it's the same idea as being sanctified or set apart by the Spirit. Jesus is saying without that work of the Holy Spirit through new birth, through sanctifying you, you cannot be a part of the kingdom of God. You cannot experience that. And so what I think Jesus is actually saying and what Paul is saying in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that it's not possible for us to believe in the truth unless the Spirit is working to enable that to happen. It's not possible for us to believe in the truth unless the Spirit is at work to enable that to happen. Uh, why is it not possible for us to believe in the truth without the work of the Spirit? Well, I think the Apostle Paul gives us a good idea in 2 Thessalonians 4 verse 4 where we read this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Uh, the God of this age is referring to Satan. And really what uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 is saying is that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He's put a blindfold on them, if you like. Uh, one of the, 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 the side effects of uh, being sinful people is that we come under Satan's power and he blinds those who are under his power to seeing the truth of Jesus, to seeing the truth of the gospel. Now, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, I'm sure that the gospel just makes total sense to you. And you think, wow, isn't this incredible? You know, God would work to save me in the ways that he does. Surely this is something you, you would accept, right? And you go out and you try and share it with others and they just look at you blankly. And you kind of think, what is wrong with you? Why, why don't you understand what I'm saying? Why can't you see that this is good news? Well, this is why. Because their minds are blinded. There's a spiritual blindfold over their eyes. They can't see the truth of the gospel. Well, friends, the Spirit of God sanctifies, gives new birth by removing the blindfold and enabling people to see the truth. And when you can see the truth clearly, you can do nothing else but accept it. But we can't accept it without the blindfold being removed. That's why Jesus says you must be born from above. Because without the Spirit of God working in us, sanctifying us, setting us apart to be God's people, we just would not see the truth and believe. John Newton in the great uh, hymn Amazing Grace said, I once was blind, but now I see. And that work of seeing is a result of the Spirit of God at work. And so as we go out uh, with the Gospel, we pray. We pray that God would be at work by His Spirit Removing the blindfolds of people. Because we know unless that happens, they will not believe. And if God had not worked in that way in us, we would not have believed either. And so one thing that uh, becomes abundantly clear is that we cannot take credit for our belief. It's not like we're smarter than everyone else out there. Oh, yes, we figured it out. They couldn't figure it out. You know, aren't we so clever? No. It's the Spirit that removes the blindfold to enable us to see that which is just plainly obvious. We cannot take the credit for our belief. But here's the thing. Why is it that the Spirit works in some and not others to enable this belief to occur? Well, that's where the first part of our verse worth remembering uh, kicks in. And so what we see is that the Holy Spirit gives new birth to those whom God has chosen to be saved. God chose you as first fruits to be saved, says the Apostle Paul. Now the idea of the first fruits there is that 
God had chosen the Thessalonians that Paul was writing to to be the first people in that city to become followers of Jesus. That's what he means by first fruits. But friends, when you look at uh, the rest of the scriptures, it becomes abundantly clear that all who end up believing believe because God has chosen them to be his people. Uh, in Ephesians 1, 4-5, we get an example of this where we read, For God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And the idea of holy and blameless is that we'll be with him, totally holy and blameless, dwelling with him forever. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Uh, the words chose and predestined are really sort of saying the same thing. Before the world came into existence, before the universe existed, God chose, God predestined those who would be his people. God chose people who would be saved. And so the logic of this verse is that the Spirit works in those that God has chosen to be saved to enable them to believe the truth. So I believe the truth about Jesus, but that would not have happened unless the Spirit of God worked in me to remove the blindfold, and that would not have happened unless God had first chosen me before the creation of the world. Now, when people hear this kind of concept, they go, Wow, isn't that a bit unfair? God chooses some and not others. You know what, what, what's kind of going on there? Um, shouldn't shouldn't all be chosen? Um, well, that's an issue that the apostle Paul wrestled with in Romans chapter nine. Indeed, listen to what he says um, as he talks about this idea of God choosing some and not others. What shall we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all, says the apostle Paul. Why? Well, verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Uh, two things to say from these verses. First of all, being the creator of all things and therefore the owner of all things gives God the right to determine who he will have mercy and compassion on, on and who he won't have mercy and compassion on. He actually has the right to show mercy, to show compassion to whomever he chooses. Uh, he is not obligated in any way to you know, show it to all. If he wants to show it to one, he can. If he doesn't want to show it to another, he is entitled to do that. So being the creator of all things, the owner of all things, gives God the right to choose who he will show mercy to and who he will show compassion to. And so Paul, he was quoting from the words of Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, when he says, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. God has the right to show his mercy and compassion as he desires. There are no obligations upon God. The second thing to highlight is I think one of the reasons why we can struggle with this idea is perhaps because we feel that we are entitled to be chosen, that we're somehow deserving of being chosen. But notice that uh, God's choosing of people to be saved is an act of mercy. And mercy by definition is not something that's given to those who are deserving. It's an act of mercy. So we're not actually deserving of or entitled to being chosen. So God has the right to choose whoever he wants and we're not entitled to being chosen. It's an act of mercy on God's part. Can I say, friends, that this issue is a very big issue, which a lot of people have spent a lot of pages writing about and debating, etc., etc., But 2 Thessalonians 2.13 is telling us that we believe in the truth because the Spirit has worked in us. 
And the reason why the Spirit has worked in us is because God has chosen us. Because God has chosen us out of mercy. And so when you think about all of that, we have no grounds for boasting. You know, I don't believe because I'm smart enough to have worked it all out for myself. No, I only believe because the Spirit of God enabled me to believe. And that only happened because God chose me, not because I deserve to be chosen, but out of mercy he chose me. Okay? And Jesus did it all anyway, didn't he? Through his life, his death, his resurrection in my place. So, so when it comes to being saved, there is nothing at all that we can boast about. We can't boast about ourselves, but we certainly should boast about God. And this brings us to the final point, which is that the merciful, saving work of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit should result in us being full of praise. Uh, Ephesians 1 again, but this time with uh, verses uh, 3, sorry, it should be verses 3 to 6 there. Uh, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, for the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Notice that Paul is urging, uh, you know, praise of God at this point. Praise God. Why? Well, because of all the blessings that are ours as followers of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul lists all those different sorts of blessings uh, through the rest of chapter 1. Things like the fact that our sins have been paid for. We are adopted to be a part of God's family. We now receive the Spirit of God, etc., etc. So there's all these great blessings that are ours. Why are these blessings ours? Because God chose us. Because God predestined. Uh, The knowledge that we have been chosen, predestined, and as a result received all of these blessings from God should lead us to praise God. Indeed, I think what verse 6 is telling us is that the reason why God has chosen people to be saved is so that they might praise Him. Praise is meant to be a key part of what we as followers of Jesus do. And indeed, praise is our big theme for the year, right? And so I keep talking regularly about our need to praise up uh, through our singing and through our praying to declare to God how great and wonderful he is, to declare our thanksgiving for all that he has done for us through choosing us and setting us apart by his spirit but saving us through his son. We should be filled with praise because, friends, we have nothing to boast about. We don't deserve anything good from God. For God, out of his mercy, his love and his grace, has showered us with blessings in Christ. We should be filled with praise. And so again, let me encourage you when we sing, when we pray, praise God with joyful with joyful hearts. Praise him for he deserves it. He deserves our praise just by virtue of the fact that he's God. How much more given what he has done for us by choosing us setting us apart and saving us through his son. So praise up, but also we need to praise out. To praise out. And uh, indeed, listen to what Acts chapter 18, verses 9 to 11 says about this. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. The Apostle Paul, and you couldn't blame him for this given all that he went through, it seems was feeling a bit afraid uh, while he was in Corinth. And so the Lord Jesus actually appears to Paul. Notice what Jesus says to Paul. I'm with you. That's the first thing. No one is going to attack and harm you. But notice the next thing he says, because I have many people in this city. What's Jesus referring to there? He's referring to the fact that in Corinth were people that God had chosen to be saved. 
He was referring to the fact that as Paul preached the gospel to these people, that the Spirit of God would be at work giving new birth, sanctifying them so that they would believe in the truth. And so the whole idea of God choosing people is actually meant to be a motivator to praise out, to declare the good news about God, about Jesus to others. And I take it the fact that Jesus has not yet returned means that there must still be more of those people out there whom God has chosen and whom he wants us to take the gospel to. And it's as we take the gospel to them that we should do so prayerfully that the Spirit of God would then work in them to remove the blindfold so that they can see and believe. So the fact that God chooses, the fact that God sets apart by his Spirit, the fact that God saves through his Son gives us no reason to boast but we should be filled with praise. Praising up, but also praising out. And so, let's come back to our verse worth remembering for today. Read it with me again if you're able. God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. So again, uh, if we want to be saved, we need to believe in the truth. We need to accept Jesus for who he is. We need to accept what he has done through his death in our place on the cross. We need to accept that he will indeed raise us from the dead as promised. We need to accept those things and demonstrate that by denying self now and being willing to do so no matter the cost. But we will not believe the truth unless the Spirit is at work, setting us apart to be Jesus' people. But the Spirit only works in those whom God has chosen whom God has chosen by his mercy. And so again, this verse tells us we do nothing. God has done it all. And therefore, it is God's name that should be praised. Up and out. With all that in mind, let me now pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you uh, not able to boast at all. We don't deserve anything good from you. But we thank you that in your mercy you chose people to be saved. And Father, we praise you that as your, uh, your gospel was preached, that uh, for many of us here today, your spirit worked to remove the blindfold that prevented us from seeing the truth and that you helped us to see the truth clearly and to accept it. And so, Father, we praise you for your mercy. We praise you for your grace and love towards us. And we pray that we would be filled with praise, that we would regularly come before you declaring how great you are, marvelling at your wonderful works towards us, marvelling at the blessings that you have given to us in the Lord Jesus and thanking you for them. Father, please forgive us whenever we boast. And Father, we pray, help us to praise you. Uh, Lord, thank you that as we uh, go out with the gospel, that we can know that there are people out there that you have chosen to respond positively to it. And so, Father, give us the perseverance to keep on going out with the gospel, knowing that truth. And as we go out, may your spirit indeed be at work, drawing people to faith, so that people will praise you. And we want to pray for these things now in Jesus' precious name.